I'd like to talk to you about 3D printing uh, living human tissue and how I believe uh, it will fundamentally change the way we practice medicine and move us towards uh, personalizing uh, medicine. But before I get into 3D printing living human tissue, uh, I want to start off with uh, a, a key reminder of the strong promise uh, of cell and organ therapy. So this picture uh, is a picture of the very first successful donor organ transplant. Uh, this was conducted in the 1950s. In this procedure, uh, Dr. Joseph Murray and his team successfully harvested uh, a kidney and uh, transplanted that into a patient saving their lives. It was undoubtedly a, a massive medical achievement of our time, one which led to uh, Dr. Joseph Murray uh, winning the Nobel Prize for medicine several years later. On the uh, right uh, hand side is a uh, photo that uh, I'm especially proud of as a Canadian. So these are eight patients uh, in, in Canada that were treated from type one diabetes via the Edmonton protocol. And so this was a protocol that was pioneered uh, in Edmonton, Alberta, where they took donor islets uh, so these are the cells that produce insulin. Uh, they were taken from these donors and put into these diabetic patients, uh, and th these eight patients were cured from type 1 diabetes, so they no longer have to live their lives uh, with uh, insulin injections. And so these serve as two amazing reminders of the true promise uh, of cell uh, and organ therapy. And now comes the stark uh, reality and the massive shortage of donor organs uh, that, we, that we face. Uh, and so we're faced with an increasing gap between donor organ supply uh, and demand. In the United States alone, about 120,000 people are on the donor organ wait list, uh, and every single day, about 20 people die waiting for a donor organ. Not only that, uh, if a patient is uh, successful and, and lucky enough to uh, obtain a donor organ, uh, they have to live the rest of their lives on immunosuppressive drugs, exposing them to a host of uh, diseases uh, like cancer. So what if we could tackle this massive uh, challenge uh, in a way very similar uh, to this movie scene where we could literally create personalized human tissue to replace damaged or diseased uh, parts inside of our body? Now, only 15 to 20 years ago, this would have been deemed the craziest uh, of science fiction, uh, but we are on a path to ultimately uh, achieving this vision. Uh, in fact, we're seeing a massive paradigm shift in the way that we think of drugs. So a small molecule drugs that we're all very familiar with uh, were once mainstream, but that market is rapidly changing. And the market for biopharmaceuticals, where the drug includes biological substances like antibodies, is rapidly increasing. And now I believe we're entering into the era of regenerative medicine, where we're looking at cells and tissues and organs as the next generation uh, of therapeutics. Similarly, in the medical device world, uh, we're seeing a massive paradigm shift. Medical devices are becoming a lot more custom and a lot more personalized. Major companies uh, are uh, having products that are being approved uh, in terms of devices that are being personalized to a particular patient. Uh, and, and so I ultimately see these massive paradigm shifts converging to ultimately enable uh, the future of therapeutics in the form of living tissue uh, therapeutics that we could print uh, with, with our technology. And so what if we wanted to print a part uh, of a lung, an airway, for example? Well, we'd start off by designing a 3D computer model uh, of an airway. Uh, and we could obtain this from a patient scan uh, just by imaging it using MRI, uh, as we've heard in the previous uh, talk. Now, we would take this uh, patient-derived uh, image and using a machine called a 3D bioprinter, we would transform that software or computer description uh, of, of the tissue into a real living tissue structure. So instead of using non-living materials like plastics and, and ceramics and metals that are using in standard 3D printing, we use real living cells. We take these cells and we combine them with other biomaterials to provide a suitable environment for the cells to grow and differentiate and ultimately uh, behave like tissues uh, in, inside of our body. Now, tissues uh, are extremely uh, complicated. Uh, they're made up of many different types uh, of materials, different cells, uh, different growth factors, different extracellular matrix, the environment that the cells grow in. And so to stand a shot at being able to recreate something as complicated uh, as tissues, we need to handle many different types of materials uh, and different complexities uh, in a streamlined approach so we could actually manufacture these. Uh, 
So you might be imagining uh, a scientist in a lab uh, that is handling many different types of materials, different cells, uh, different biomaterials, and they would be switching between many different tools. Uh, this would be very manually intensive, very time consuming, very prone to, to error. And so what we've actually done is we've miniaturized an entire uh, laboratory on a single microfluidic chip. Uh, this chip serves as our printhead, and so this is what we actually uh, use to dispense the many types of materials that are required to create tissues. I'm actually holding uh, one of these uh, chips in my hand. It's about the size of a USB stick. And so what this chip allows us to do is to take uh, all of the different ingredients that make up tissues inside of our body, bring all of these as inputs, and through computer control, we could uh, sequence, we could combine, we could process these materials in real time and then dispense these multi-material, these heterogeneous formulations to create uh, these very complex structures and compositions that make up our tissues. And so here's an example where we were switching between several different biological input materials. We've labeled them different colors here, but these would represent different biological inputs like cells and, and ECM or the extracellular matrix that the cells live in and, and growth factors to take stem cells and differentiate those into either kidney cells or liver cells or, or, or cardiac cells. Uh, so these materials are rapidly dispensed to create these three-dimensional uh, structures that, that are living. And so they're built to mimic the natural arrangement of cells uh, inside of our body. So if we take one of these uh, printed tissue structures and we zoom into uh, one of them uh, at the microscopic level, uh, we could see each individual uh, cell represented by a single uh, green dot. And over time, these cells begin to communicate, and, and they begin to talk, and they form these beautiful 3D interconnected networks. But it's not just that these tissues are living, they're ultimately functioning. They're functioning just like we would expect inside of our body. So to show that with our airway tissues, we're able to take things like histamine, which is released in our body, and we could add histamine to these printed airway muscle tissues, and they begin to contract. Uh, then we could take common anti-asthma therape therapeutics like salbutamol and we could get these tissues to relax. And so the main message here is that these tissues are functioning just like tissues inside of our body. And so you could imagine how we could print tissues that are personalized to each individual, personalized to you, personalized to me, uh, and we can replace damage function uh, inside of our body. Now I'd like to give you a couple of examples of tissues that we're focusing on for transplantation. Uh, the first is knee meniscus tissue uh, for surgical therapy. Uh, so the knee meniscus is one of the most commonly uh, damaged parts of the knee. It plays a very important function. It absorbs shock. Uh, and unfortunately, once a damage occurs, it doesn't get better on its own. Uh, it, one of the main reasons is it isn't well vascularized. It doesn't have a blood supply um, that uh, goes throughout the structure. And so once a damage occurs, it just starts to degenerate and it gets worse and worse over time. Uh, current surgical strategies include meniscectomies, where a surgeon will go in and try to remove the damaged parts, or in some extreme cases, uh, they'll conduct a full meniscectomy and they'll remove the entire meniscus, which could alleviate the acute pain, but introduces arthritis in the knee. Uh, and so it's literally a massive pain point. Uh, there are no good solutions uh, right now on the market for this problem. Uh, and so what we're focused on doing is we have a vision where somebody who has a meniscus tear or a degenerative meniscus, they would go to the hospital or the doctor's office, we would take an uh, image uh, of their knee uh, using MRI. We'd have that custom geometry. Uh, then we'd take a sample of cells uh, that would be custom to that patient. We would combine the custom uh, geometry and the custom cells. And using our printing technology, using the microfluidic approach, we could take all of those necessary ingredients, all of those materials, and recreate uh, this crescent-shaped structure that plays such an important role uh, inside of our body to help people live active longer uh, in their lives. Uh, and so we would take that tissue and arthroscopically implant it uh, into, into a knee, uh, replacing the damaged part, and the patient would be on their path uh, to recovery. Another example uh, of an application that we are working on is in the uh, diabetes space, specifically type 1 diabetes. So this is where we are focused on creating a pancreatic patch uh, for type 1D. Uh, so type 1 diabetes is an autoimmune disease. Uh, it involves the immune system targeting and killing the insulin-producing beta cells in our pancreas. And so patients who have type 1 diabetes uh, aren't able to produce enough insulin to regulate glucose levels in the blood, which is a big problem. It has uh, at least 
significant morbidity. Uh, what makes matters even worse, this disease is usually diagnosed at a very, very young age. So you can imagine uh, the uh, traumatic news to a child or, or their parents when they're diagnosed uh, with type 1 uh, diabetes, which could significantly limit the quality of their life and, and how they have to manage this, this disease. Um, and so what we're focused on doing uh, yeah, to solve this problem is we're creating a, a 3D printed pancreatic patch that would include immune protecting biomaterials uh, that would shield the cells that produce insulin from the immune system. And we're also vascularizing uh, this tissue so that we could see the cells alive. They could get enough nutrients and access to, to oxygen so that this could be a permanent uh, solution. What we're thinking is that this tissue one day will be implanted under the skin subcutaneously, and, and this tissue would actually sense glucose in the blood, and the cells within this tissue patch would, uh, in, as a result of that sensing, biologically release insulin and regulate glucose levels in the blood. So we could take people off of managing uh, insulin injections and, and having uh, a better uh, overall quality of life. So this entire field of bioprinting has really been exploding. Uh, if we look at the past few years, uh, the past decade actually, we could see an exponential growth in the uh, academic publications focused on bioprinting technology. Uh, so we think this is very exciting and it's also a uh, leading indicator for the creation of an entirely new uh, space. So recognizing uh, this, uh, we are forming a global network uh, uh, where we partner very closely with some of the best researchers in the world that have specific domain expertise, as well as uh, major companies in the medtech and pharma space, where we focus on developing different applications, uh, and we work to uh, actually promote and advance some of these uh, opportunities, the most promising opportunities into commercial and clinical outcomes that will ultimately benefit patients. Uh, so from developing neural tissue uh, to better understand neurodegenerative diseases like Parkinson's and Alzheimer's to developing cardiac tissue uh, to developing kidney tissue uh, through this uh, network effect that we're creating globally, we think we stand a, a strong chance at enabling a future where we could create human tissues uh, on demand. Now, I believe some of the biggest challenges uh, in healthcare really require us uh, to operate at the intersection of exponentially uh, growing uh, disciplines and technologies. We need a diversity in perspective. Uh, and so 3D printing living human tissues requires us uh, to operate at the cutting edge of material science, uh, 3D printing, uh, in our specific case, microfluidics and microfabrication, as well as biology uh, and medicine. Uh, and so our team uh, at Aspect really exemplifies is this. We bring people from all around the world uh, that are uh, coming together around a common vision. They bring a background in cell biology, biomaterial science, uh, immunology, uh, software engineering, robotics, computer engineering. And so we have a really uh, diverse uh, team that is wholeheartedly committed to making a meaningful impact on, on patients. And so it's through diversity uh, that we are innovating uh, on the 3D printing of living human tissues to ultimately personalize uh, healthcare. Uh, now, uh, I believe as the world gets more and more uh, advanced, the problems uh, that we are faced, and we heard many of these problems throughout the conference, are becoming a lot more complex. Uh, so I think to come up with the most compelling solutions to 3D printing living human tissue or tackling climate change or food security, we're going to need to talk to one another. We're going to need to marry uh, exponential technologies and bring different disciplines to come up with solutions that can really uh, tackle some of these massive global challenges. And so that's why I think uh, platforms like this are fantastic to give us an opportunity to come together, to share, uh, to discuss, and to ultimately connect the dots. Thank you very much. Terrific work at the convergence of technologies. Uh, my clinical field is, is bone marrow transplantation, which is really the, the most uh, established form of stem cell therapy we've been doing for 50 years. But there's a lot of hype and hope in sort of the stem cell or regenerative medicine field. Any advice to folks who might be even looking for therapies today uh, to do it in a safe uh, and efficacious way? Yeah, I, I think uh, there's obviously a lot of excitement with stem cell technology because I think people see the potential. Uh, I think it's important to let science prove itself out and, and, and look at the data. So for anybody who is interested in the potential of stem cell technology, I would, I would, I would urge them to get educated, see the potential, and then ultimately follow the data. Uh, like some people say, in God we trust, everybody else show me the data. So if the stem cell therapy proves to be successful, uh, then, then I think uh, it's something that patients could, could actually wrap their heads around and, and it could be something that, that actually makes a difference in their lives. Great. Thanks so yeah. much. Watch thanks. the space. Yes. Thanks. All right. Thank you.